All right. Welcome everyone to the Live Ship Traders trilogy spoiler filled discussion. We're um, I'm of course Alex. If you're on my channel, so you know me. But I uh, obviously on this channel I talk about science fiction, fantasy, and mostly science fiction, fantasy, and then sometimes talk about horror and some other genres as well when I have some other time and thoughts come up about different books but i'm joined today by five wonderful guests three of which four of which who have read the series full series all 16 books in the realm of the Elderlings, some more than that and some multiple times and i'll let them go around and introduce themselves before we start diving into live ship traders thoughts so i guess if you want to just go in a circle we can start with you jordan and then kind of go around right. if everyone's in the same order um, I'm Jordan. Uh, my channel is Jordan Reads. I also primarily read fantasy sci-fi um, and sometimes some other stuff, but pretty much just fantasy sci-fi. I um, am one of the ones that has not read the entire Realm of the Elderlings. I have gotten through Live Ship Traders and I'm about to start Tawny Man. So I do not know what happens after this series. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, uh, I'm Amanda. My channel is Shelf Unstable, and I also talk about uh, sci-fi, fantasy, and uh, associated genres. Um, I read all of Realm of the Elderlings, like one after another, uh, just about a year ago. So uh, still fresh and uh, still love it, and can't wait to talk about it with you guys. Is it me? Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Chris. I'm from the channel Chris Bookish Cauldron. Um, and I'm one of the ones that I've read it a few times. So I've read all the Realm of the Elderlings twice, and I've read this particular trilogy three times because it's probably my favorite in all of the trilogies. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking about it because I love this stuff. And I'm Jake, and I've also read all of Realm of the Elderlings. I read Farseer in the first time for like 2020, and then I read the rest of it in 2021, and then I've read Farseer again in 2022. I'm like, my channel is like 90% fantasy, like nine and a half percent sci-fi and like 0.5% other. Uh, and yeah, it's live ship is like Realm of the Elderlings as a whole. Normally, if you just ask me like, hey, what's your favorite series? I just say Realm of the Elderlings. But if you're like, that doesn't count as a series, pick a sub series, then I'd be like, okay, live ship. But yeah, so cool. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> and I'm Deary's read it before, and I've read Realm of the Elderlings a lot. Um, <laughs> Live ships, I met at 20 plus rereads, and I'm about to start another reread. I've just finished Fast Year again. Wild. We all <laughs> bow down to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Deary has read more than everyone more than everyone else <laughs> combined. Has she read it more than the entirety of chat combined? Is my next question. <laughs> Yeah. Probably. <laughs> um, I have a question for you, Derry. When you reread them, do you reread on audiobook or are you always a physical rereader? Good question. Um, I struggle with the audiobooks because okay. some of the narrators really don't work for me. Um, Same. Yeah. I'm Same. okay with Farsia. Farsia's narrator is, is pretty good. Um, that's really the only one I can do on Audible. Okay. Um, I was just curious. So, yeah. It, yeah, it's usually eyeballed. <laughs> Hello. Hello. And yes, All right. we'll do that, Theo. Come on. <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, well, I get on to that. <laughs> <laughs> I have read um I'm like Jordan. I just finished Live Ship this past month, so haven't read Tawny Man, but we'll be starting it very soon. So don't know any of the story past here and when looking up <laughs> recaps of what happened in live shifts for little tiny details it was very careful about what was oh, yeah. linked to what in later cities because some of this some of the sites just like really just put it all out there for you but. yeah <laughs> google is the enemy when you're doing yeah. long fantasy series yeah yeah, yeah. i googled uh, some kennet fan art when i was like oh, God. maybe halfway through ship of magic and right there images kennet ludluck Ah. Oh my god! Oh, god. oh I was just oh, thinking no. like, oh yeah, he would have one. He'd have like the peg leg, and then you're like blood luck, and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. to when I'm talking about characters. I've had to catch myself a couple times because normally I'll say a character's full name, and I have to all. I've sometimes been like Kenneth from the live ship train. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. This is a spoiler discussion, so like if you're here, I'm sure you've either read it before, but if you want to, we can touch on just, I guess, overall thoughts on the trilogy, 
just what your thoughts are in the trilogy. Obviously, if you read it more than once, I'm sure you have more positive, like significantly more positives and negatives about it. Um, but just before we dive into like any of the characters or any of the, uh, I guess the story itself, just what your overall thoughts on it, maybe c- compared to Farseer and where it sits in like your overall realm of the Elderlings when you look back on the series after after it's plus. But for me, I mean, I've only read Farseer and Live Ship, obviously, and this I think was the tighter trilogy. I think I loved Farseer, but I definitely noticed like there's I can definitely acknowledge that Farseer has its flaws. I think in a number. of of areas but i think when it comes to the story i think live ship was just i don't know it was just from beginning to end was just extremely tight a lot of plot a lot of amazing characters some of the best character development i've read and it all came together pretty impressively for three book for a three book series it was kind of impressive how she tied everything together so yeah i mean i absolutely love this trilogy but i'm gonna let everyone else kind of go, go into what their thoughts on her are on it first so yeah yeah i i agree i feel like the what worked i i also liked live ship more than farseer and i think what worked for me so well is the multi pov setup instead of like first person um just because you get to learn so much more of the world and i loved like being in all these different locations throughout all of live ship and yeah the characters are just like top notch some of the best like slow burn character arcs out there yeah. Uh, I think for me, I actually prefer Farseer over Live Ships. Um, I do love the Live Ship trilogy uh, very much. I don't want to want to make it seem like I don't like it, um, but it, it might be my least favorite uh, subset of Realm of the Elderlings. Um, but uh, I think I was one of the like I miss fits for the first hundred pages yeah. of Ship of Magic. Like I don't care about these psychopaths. Like put me back with fits. Um, and but. I, I do remember being just shocked at how well Robin Hobb pulled off the perspective change. Uh, like it, it was, it, she just, yeah. she does just as good of a job, like no matter if she's writing first person POV or all the different third persons. And then uh, the world building expansion was incredible. And some of her like best prose when she's describing like the rain wilds or the river or the beach, like just like such good stuff. And my favorite part's probably all the mystery that we get and the slow reveals of uh, yeah. the serpents and the dragons. Yeah. Um, I agree with most of everything everyone's saying. It's one of my favorites. I think that she has some of her strongest character work here, just in terms of how much characters um, grow and change throughout the course of the books. And the multi POV allows her to do a lot of really smart things. So one of the criticisms that sometimes gets levied against Farseer and some of the Fitz books a criticism I should note that I do not agree with um, are that her villains are kind of mustache twirly. I personally disagree. I think all of her villains are very interesting. But I think that the villains in uh, Live Ship are the most interesting because the multi POV experience allows you to see things from their point of view. And oftentimes they have a very cold, calculating way that's very logical. That's my cat knocking over my keys. If anybody heard that. Um, <laughs> Um, and she manages to make a lot of these villains feel very human um, in ways that sometimes some of the other villains in her other novels don't necessarily feel just because they're limited to Fitz's first person perspective. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, Live Ship is also, it's my favorite of them. I'd say if I were to compare like what I think the strength of the Live Ships to the Fitz's ones are, I, I will say some like individual moments from the Fitz trilogies have stuck with me a little bit longer than Live Ship. And as I was reading Live Ship, though, I found, like, the most consistently engaging. I'm a huge fan of how, like, the multiple POVs lets you see multiple perspectives. Like, I think being able to see yeah. Althea from Ronica and Althea's point of view adds depth to Althea that I think we wouldn't even get, even if it was, like, all from Althea's point of view. And I think the same thing is from the villain, like, Regal, we only ever see from Fitz's point of view and Regal kind of hates Fitz and Fitz kind of hates Regal. So like, they're always unpleasant to each other. So we're just kind of like, well, this person's always unpleasant, but presumably they're not always unpleasant. They're just always unpleasant when Fitz is there. And I think we really get to see that like with the entire cast of characters. I don't think there's a single flat character in this entire trilogy. It's pretty, I think the characterization is like, it's off the charts, both in like how quickly I got attached to people and their development. And like, even the boats have psychological depth. Yeah. Um, and I also think it's the strongest thematically, I think, 
um, would be, but they're all they're all pretty fantastic for that. So I would say overall live ship is my favorite, but like individual moments from Fitz books have stuck with me the longest, maybe just from me in first person or how well I know Fitz. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And fabulous points, everybody. Um, I've read it a lot, so yeah, I like it. Um, <laughs> It's <laughs> what Jake said, I think is great. It, it is the, the thematically richest. The conversations you can have around this trilogy are innumerable. There are so many things that get hit on. As to comparing it to Farsia, Farsia feels like a very intimate story. I mean, okay, Fitz yeah. goes off on missions and does stuff, but it still feels very contained. Whereas Live Ships very much is Robin Hobb stretching her wings and going, okay people want to hear this story i can broaden that into the greater world and she does it exceptionally well it it's of all the trilogies the one that stands best alone obviously the fitz ones all rely on each other and having said that it sits probably third in my overall ranking but i'm really attached to fitz it's one of those I'm always waiting to get back to Fitz, no matter the high points, no matter the excitement. Yeah. So I always end up with a bigger gap than I anticipate between the reread of Farsia and Live Ships because I just am not as excited to go back because I don't personally miss any of those characters. But I always miss Fitz. I always want to get back to what Fitz is doing. <laughs> and that's kind of, you know, how the series goes. So for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very interesting point. I think for me, that's kind of similar when it comes to on my first read through what I expected going into live ships after finishing Farce here was like, well, when I was reading Farce here, everyone kind of reached out and was like, oh, if you like this, just wait till live ships, like live ships is going to blow you away. So going into that trilogy, I was pretty hyped up to it. So I was just like kind of being like, I'm sure it'll live up to the hype, to the hype for it, but at the same time, I loved Farseer and I really got attached to Fitz and all the characters in that trilogy. So moving away from that and seeing how Robin Hobb was going to set up a whole new cast of characters with the multi POV setting and a whole new part of the world just was something that I was like, kind of just went along with and hope for the best, but pleasantly surprised. I think like pretty quickly into Ship of Magic, I was attached to the characters. And I think at this point, we can kind of just gradually go, just go into spoilers because I think spoiler conversation, but I think linear, we don't have to talk linear linearly or anything like that. But I think if we start with just ship of magic in general, just cause that's where the story starts and some of the character arcs start. So I think it really sets the tone for the rest of the trilogy. And I mean, going into that book, the one thing that I heard about it, I didn't know what the plot was. So I didn't even read the back of Ship of Magic because everyone has told me, like, don't read the back of the Realm of the Elderlings books because they will spoil everything. Curse you, the golden fool. Everything. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, like, I didn't even know that the uh, Efren Vestrit died. So, like, that whole thing, that was just part of, on that first read, or that my read through, I was just part of the story that I was experiencing. So I was getting attached to characters right away despite but the one criticism i heard is something i've heard jake you've talked about how you know everyone says like ship of magic starts off very slow but they say it a lot of times it seems like people use it in a negative way like they'll say it ship of magic starts off slow it's kind of a tedious book to get into and i just never felt like that like i think obviously there's a lot of ground covered over the course of a couple of days but I don't know. Her writing and character writing kind of blew me away from the start. So I was kind of hooked. But what do you guys think of Ship of Magic and how it starts and just the, the overall plot and how you're introduced to all these new characters compared to moving away from what you knew in Farseer? So like when people say it's slow, I don't know if I can blame them because I think like if you were to look at how methodically it outlines, it's like yeah, somewhat objectively slow. It's where I'm like when people are like, oh, it was a rough start. I was like, yeah, I mean, I thought it was a brilliant start like the first Kennet <laughs> chapter i feel like i understood Kennet as well as i've understood characters that i've read like an entire book from after that first chapter yeah. uh i still one of my favorite like the most Kennet internal monologue ever where if i was going to sum up Kennet with one thing which obviously you can't do because he's ridiculously complex is when he's like the charm and he's like oh yeah they 
they like cut the tongue out of the person who like did the charm. So like he couldn't say anything. And like, I don't think it was actually effective, but I really, I think like, I appreciate the the message, which is so backwards from like how, like I could see someone being like, oh, that was really brutal. But like, I'm glad to see the precaution or like, well, that was really brutal. And I wish they didn't do it or just like yeah. being fine with it in general, but he likes the idea of it and doesn't think it's effective. And then, yeah, Efron, man, has, like, six lines of dialogue, and I was still more upset by his death than I am by, like, yeah. that's in fiction. Um, yeah. I didn't have the experience of, like, going from the Assassin books to Life Ships, because oh, Life Ships was the it. first book series for me. Um, and the reason it was the first for me was because I had heard people say that um, it was the best, and I had heard people say that if you really wanted to see Robin Hobb shine to know if this big, long 16-book series was for you, you should try the live ships first. Which I ended up making all the connections that you're supposed to make between the Assassin books and live ships just in reverse order. Um, so I didn't have to go from that experience, and I found the characters riveting from the start. I loved uh, getting into Kenneth's mind immediately on the Treasure Beach. I found the conversations between him and the Oracles really interesting. And on a reread, you notice a lot of very interesting um, foreshadowing um, that happens in, in that instance. Um, so it's a very smart way to set up what's to come. And um, I loved it from the beginning. I loved learning about Wintrow and his um, monastery when he was um, doing the stained glass. I loved learning about Althea. Right from the get-go, I found them all very engaging characters, and I knew instantly that I was going to enjoy the book. The first time, when I first started Ship of Magic, I had read the back of the book, so I did know some of the setup. But I um, I was listening to the audiobook, and the audiobook, is, <laughs> the narrator is, like, so wild. Um, <laughs> and so it, like, took me a minute to, like really even follow because i was like this narrator's voices are whack so but i got used to it and then ended up listening to the whole series and like actually really enjoyed it but the beginning for me was like a little weird just like acclimating to the narrator but um yeah the same like with all the characters i was like i already feel like i know them all and they're all my family now <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, does Ship of Magic open with a serpent POV? Yeah, like yeah. The, the first thing you it's get. Like yes. Yeah. Two pages. Yep. Uh, and then it's a pretty long kind of chapter. Yeah, I remember, you know, I think I had finished Assassin's Quest to like 22 hours before I started uh, Ship of Magic. <laughs> and just going from like Fitz POV into that serpent prologue, you're like, what? Oh, <laughs> uh, <my God. laughs> but uh, the, the serpent uh sections were probably my favorite part of the whole trilogy um just love the serpents like they have that just like mystical like what's going on like memory issues like some existential yeah. threat to them and it's so like so mysterious and just like so tied in with all the other reveals uh that that just like blew my mind and it's still the first thing i think of when i think of uh the live ship trilogy and then yeah just being introduced in ship of magic uh right through these serpents and then on to like the alien world that is others island and then getting to meet like such weird people that have uh, like sorry if you can hear my cat screaming over there but uh yeah just uh it was like so jarringly different but like so beautifully written and so strange that yeah it was just uh yeah in entrancing uh, reading yeah. Ship of Magic for the first time. I've seen so many people like say that the serpent chapters were their least favorite and it took them out of the story every time. But I'm with yeah. you. I loved them. Like they were so, they were so cool because I was like, I have no idea what's going on, but I'm yeah. here for it. Like, and the yeah. way they so talk exciting. to each other. Yeah, when they first uh when I first figured out that like the plenty was the sea and the lack was the sky. It's like, oh like this whole serpent language <laughs> we're talking to. Yeah, it's it's great. I know both, yeah, I like, like I, I got my mom to read Realm of the Otherlings, and then she convinced my sister to just read Live Ship, and both of them, after Ship of Magic, were like, so I must, am I supposed to know what the serpent things are about? And I'm just like, don't worry about <laughs> yeah. it. It'll make yeah. sense later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's an ongoing mystery. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, um, the serpents are, I think, a brilliant way to just kind of literally dump you in this world. You're being thrown in splash there you go you're somewhere foreign you're somewhere alien there's going to be a very different vibe to this trilogy and yeah. as amanda says that language that she has them use really makes it clear that these are not people they have a different 
reality. They they put importance on different things. And I love that. Um, I remember in my first read, that whole, what? <laughs> like when you realize that you're in a serpent's perspective and wondering, why are they here? And rather than going, these are weird, I'm not interested, I was going, these are weird. They're here for a reason and trying to work that out as I read. And with that in mind, the clues are there really early on. But it's easy to overlook if you're just not happy about them being there. And a lot of readers aren't. They're like, oh, these chapters are awful. Why are they here? And I've even heard people say they skip Serpent chapters. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't do that. I'm like, yeah, how does really it short end? anyways? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, they're like six pages. <laughs> Yeah. Like nothing will make sense at the done. end if you skip them. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. that's one thing I think Live Ship like does clearly better than Farseer's like magical payoffs, where oh, I yeah. think as much as like I just reread Assassin's Quest reasonably, uh, like recently, and as much as like I loved Assassin's Quest on reread, like some of the magical payoffs, it's just like it's like this is how it works, and I was just kind of like, cool. Oh. But like the Live Ship payoffs, it's like. It gets revealed and you're just like holy crap oh there's like so many hints for that and i think yeah. it does that like really really well and the serpent chapters are a huge part of that and i think isn't there foreshadowing like the first wintro chapter isn't like the monitor yes. like the stained gas thing yep. last it's, thing yeah yeah it's a Look forward to that. yeah yeah, he, he makes the point that all of Wintrow's art has both the dragon and the serpent in it mm -hmm. and Wintrow says i i don't deliberately put them there they're, they're they're oh, part yeah, of the yeah, world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, it's just. Oh. <laughs> I, I always like the serpent. How did you it, feel about it, Alex? Chris, are you saying? I could. I, no, 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 no just, go for it. Oh, well, the serpent chapters, I, you know, at first I didn't know what they were because I didn't know they were serpents. At least for the first couple of those chapters, I couldn't tell they were what they were. I was kind of reading it but i enjoyed it because i thought it set the scene and the tone of the, where the story was going right from the start and i enjoyed it and added a bunch of mis magical intrigue right from the get-go and i was like okay i'm curious to know what's going on here and i want to keep reading um but yeah i never was ever bothered by those and i thought like with all of her character work i think that just had an excellent payoff at, at the end so i feel like any of those slow intimate moments quote unquote slower moments with any of those characters I think by the end, they all just have a pretty amazing payoff when it comes to either a magical reveal or just a character development or something along the way. So, I want to know what her outlining is like for a book, like for a series like this, or just like for the realm of the elderlings in general. Like, what <laughs> must her outlining be like? Her descriptions of her outlines are always really funny because she says, like, she does do outlines, like her editor wants her to do an outline, and then she just like ignores the outline. Like she just goes <laughs> off of it. So she said, like, I have an outline for like all 16 books, but like I could use those outlines again if I wanted to. Like, like it's Robert, a different you never, book. You never Realm of the Otherlings version two. Yeah. <laughs> version two, yeah. except not the version where this time I follow the outline, the version where I ignore the outline in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> we go yeah. different too. <laughs> Yeah, there's, she, a, yeah. there's a fabulous interview on YouTube with she and George uh, George Martin with their oh, yeah, joint good. editor. And um, people are saying, like, why do you make Fitz do these things? And she's gone, I don't. I write things because that's how Fitz would do stuff. And he makes decisions. And um, I get angry with Fitz because he makes these decisions. And he's just added 100 pages to my story. Yeah, I like to think in her outlines, everyone makes like really logical decisions. Yeah, and then as she writes it, she's just like, "Why won't you just be normal?" Like, yeah. There were there, there were actually no serpents. There were actually no serpents in live ship. She just started typing, and it was a serpent. Uh, <laughs> I, I would love to read her initial outlines. To be fair, because the fall was yeah. only ever supposed to be in one scene. So when you consider that he yeah, became that. the heart of of this series, that's insane to me that Farseer was initially a standalone, not trilogy, that grew into Realm of the Elderlings is astonishing. That she finished Tawny Man and that was the end of the, se of the series, not intending to continue, is astonishing. That she gets to book 16 and is still tying things in from the first book, 
blows my mind because all of the foreshadowing is there. Yeah, I just read my first year and there that was like a ton of foreshadowing and I was like, how how is this not planned? Like I guess yeah. she's just yeah. really good at like taking what she has and like doing that well so like it looks like it was all planned but uh, i like to yeah. think that in the original outline of ship yeah. of magic althea just went to the other live ships and were like look what they're doing and all the other live ships were like well this needs to stop and then that was it that was the book it was like it was yeah. Like, yeah it was a short but story but yeah but then yeah. in reality althea was just like foolish and hobbs just sitting there like typing like facepalm and like althea come on like what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> the uh, yeah. serpents are really interesting to me because um, she, in an interview with Christopher Paolini, revealed that the whole dragon life cycle is based off of dragonflies. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I thought it's... that was like fascinating because the serpents are like after they lay the eggs in the water. So I was like, ah. Oh. Every time I reread them now, and I get to the serpent bits. I just like to imagine them as like dragonfly babies. Yeah. And you <laughs> said, horrible. Chris, you've said Robin Hobb has your favorite dragons, or does your favorite dragons? Yeah, they are so my favorite dragons. Down. Yeah. Same. Uh, it's awesome. I love that they're just basically like giant cats. I think that's why I like, like them so much. Except like they actually can exert their will. Like Amanda's <laughs> cat was yelling at her, but if it was a dragon, it would actually just like break open the door and be like, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so with, with live ship... Of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with Ship of Magic, I think the big standout characters for me were, I mean, I don't know. When I was doing my review, I had wanted to talk about every single character, but and I kept forgetting about Brashen, but always do. Um, but Wintro and Althea, I'd say, and yeah. Kenneth and Kyle were like the big Ship of Magic characters. And I think, what was your guys' favorite character Ship of Magic? Or which one did you kind of associate yourself with the most when you were reading it? Or think back on the most in that book specifically before? Not how they end up. <laughs> Wintro. <Malta. laughs> yeah. Malta in book one. I loved her from <laughs> the first moment I met her. I, I knew she was destined for great things. I will not tolerate Malta hatred in this household. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, ba I was like, Wintro was my favorite. I thought Kenneth was like the most complex, but I just yeah. like Wintro more because like Kenneth kind of sucks. So <laughs> like that held him back a little bit. Uh, so yep. it was Wintro and then like Althea close second. Um, and then it was Kenneth. And then I still liked everyone else. And then in the next two books, like I didn't, I Wintro, like book one is my favorite Wintro plot, maybe even my favorite Althea plot. And then I like like every other character more in the later books. And those two yeah. are slightly less, just kind of all. Yeah. I think Wintro is an easy character for really bookish people to love instantly because he is us on any fantasy yeah. adventure. Like, <laughs> Introverted, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get me out of here. <laughs> Can we just be smart about this? Do we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, like, no, I you can... didn't out wrestle a bear, folks. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Come on. Kenneth was definitely like the most compelling for sure. I just remember laughing like every time he was like, uh, like he was trying so hard to do bad and like good things yeah. just kept happening. Yeah. And yeah. I loved it. Um, but yeah, Winter was definitely like the most, uh, the person I felt the most for, for sure. <laughs> Favorite thing about Kennet is like in hindsight, if he wasn't a point of view, like you would think he was literally a good guy for the first yeah eighty yeah, percent of the series, and it yeah. looked like it came like it looked like it was terrible. It'd be like, where did this come from? Like this guy was totally <laughs> a good guy like the entire time, but like he actually like even in Ship of Destiny, the closest I've ever come to throwing a book both times yeah. was in Ship of Destiny. Was like I was like, oh wow, Kenneth's actually turned around, and then I got the Kenneth point of view, and I forgot exactly what it was, but it was him being all conniving, and I was like, damn it, Kenneth, and I, I literally <laughs> almost threw my copy. Yeah, of Destiny. it's like when he finally takes over the Vivacia, and uh, he's like walking amongst the slavehold, and um, he starts like crying <laughs> because the smell is so bad, but the slaves oh, yeah. all <laughs> think he's he crying <laughs> because <laughs> of their privation, and it's just hilarious because like he just automatically the goodwill that the people throw on him that's totally unearned is hilarious. Mm -hmm. Imagine actually live shit, but Kenneth isn't a point of view. Like imagine Literally, like how you would, would be see like crazy. Different 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 like, different he would be like people like eighty percent into it would be like, oh, he's such a Gary Stu. Like yeah. you know, <laughs> he's just he's mustache always, twirling. Like, moral, like and then in his yeah. head he's Opposite actually like the villain. Like, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And doesn't yeah. he, he even pretty much spells it out for us like pretty early. He's like, yeah, I'm bad, but for some reason, good <laughs> things happen to people when I'm around. So they all yep. love me and that kind of works out for me. So I'm really yeah. not going to yeah. complain about that. And I'm going to keep up that appearance because yeah. yeah, it's really getting me yeah. somewhere. Yeah. When Wintro gives that like rousing speech and he's like, okay, okay, I can work with this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Kenneth was definitely yeah. the most intriguing from the start for me. Uh, but Wintro was definitely my favorite. I just saw myself, or younger self at him, I would say, more than any other characters in that. Uh, Kyle was the character, the one character that I went into the series expecting one way or the other, because that's like what every fantasy reader who has read it says, is you will hate Kyle with a bleeding passion. So much. And... And I, I, I definitely did, especially after reading Ship of Magic. But um, I really thought I, he would be much more pivotal to the story, though. Later, I did too. Yeah, I hundred percent thought that too. But uh, his yeah. relationship with Gwintro in Book One was brutal. It was just uh, like it's really it's hard. really good stuff. Um, the, my favorite moment, probably actually from Book One, is when. Um, Wintro gets forcibly tattooed when they're all in the. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, that's like one of the most intense moments, um, because there's something about it that's just like wow. Like I don't know, there's something about it where you realize just how cold that Kyle views the world that he's willing to brand his son as property and the ship's property at that is just kind of really intense. And Wintro also gets some of the best like liners out there, like after he gets his finger amputated. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to remember the exact wording, but he ends up basically giving his finger to um, his father and saying, you can wear it as like a trophy because you've broken me down or something like that, basically. And it's just such an intense, um, yeah. great line. He, he gets some really good singers out there. That's probably my favorite scene from Ship of Magic. It's yeah, so good. Um, that. It's, yeah. Except, you know, I, it's for some reason, like it, in my head, it's like a that seems like a victory for Rintro, even though it was like... <laughs> oh. finger cut off but yeah it is a victory no, for Wintrow, yeah but it is like it is a victory internally it's like oh, yeah. you know he's like the entire time people yeah, have been it's calling not him, moral like, high ground so much he doesn't as... want to do stupid things and now yeah, he's just yeah. like see like yeah when it's necessary like it's fine guys i just like i'm not dumb enough to fight a bear like, but then, <laughs> like on, kyle yeah. is just the dad yeah, i'm not a coward will... i'm just not a dick <laughs> yeah, but but Kyle is the dad that's like never gonna accept you, like no matter what exactly. you do. Like if if Wintro yep. had cried about losing his thumb, Kyle would have been disappointed. But uh, Wintro held back all that pain or put some into Vivacia maybe, and like doesn't make a sound while he's getting his finger chopped off. And Kyle is like, "You freak! That's so weird!" <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's just there's just no pleasing and, and Kyle. He feels as a misunderstood. Figure. That, that Kyle feels misunderstood, it always just, I think, is why I hate him so much. It's like, you yeah. genuinely don't understand that the way you're doing everything is so wrong. But he feels completely entitled. He feels everything is completely justified. And I just hate him so much. <laughs> funny uh, right. philip chase mm. has said like but don't you guys like at the end like feel a bit of like yeah. compassion for kyle because like nope. he has to go through these things and i'm like <laughs> it's very nice that you think that philip but um i would not pee on him if he was on fire yeah so... no nope. nothing there's I there's actually standing um... around with my liter of water cheering <laughs> yeah i'd be the, like uh... oh do you want some water and then i'd swap it out with gasoline and she'd be like here you go you can <laughs> yeah <laughs> literally <laughs> yeah be like oops it's, it's just casual state happens it's funny because in yeah. Ship of Destiny, like not to skip ahead to the way end, but when he when he dies, there's a line. I think it like ends the chapter that it, that where he dies, where it just says his blood is like in pool, still pools of blood on the Vivacia or Vivacia because the ship just didn't accept him at, yeah. even through his death. Yeah. And I was just like, just nice. That was like yeah. pretty. Yeah. Also, I just rejected Malta, like, utterly. <laughs> Malta's like, oh no, it's horrible that like Kyle's been captured. And even though I'm oh like, aha, get wrecked, Kyle, I still feel bad for Malta somehow. Cause I mean, it's like, it's her dad. Yeah. But yeah. also, like, 
my, one of my favorite parts of the Mad Champ is when Wintro is just like not actually saying he wants to profit. He's like, oh, I mean, I just like I don't want him to die. I just wish it was somehow like possible, like he was dead. And Ken just is just like, I can work with this. And then he does that, and he comes back, and Wintro's like, you can't do that. And Ken is legitimately doing? confused, like how he could have done something wrong. <laughs> and it's just like, what do you mean? Like, like I literally did exactly what you wanted me to. I'm right in no media. <laughs> Yeah. That surprised me so much. I like actually, like Jordan said, expected him to have a much bigger role in the and next then there two was, books. Like, yeah, the priest dude so. as well, who I was expecting to be like an antagonist, and then kind of just killed him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. That was, uh, that was that was awesome. Great. It just took me a minute. I was like cycling. I was like priest. Dude. <laughs> yeah. It took me a minute there. <laughs> that was all in like that same sequence yeah, of events. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah that yeah, chapter's yeah. so good. Yeah, yeah a, that's a matchup. I'm jumping all over the place. But. Oh, we can jump all over the place. I think like, um, I think Jake, you've talked about it. And I think of one of the streams before that I was listening to, where you said, you know, this is a guy who, him and Kefria have always had this one type of relationship. But the second that he's put in a position of leadership, and all of a sudden everything around his responsibilities has changed. His total behavior towards everyone around him, and yeah, I said he's like the middle manager who like looks yeah. confident as a middle manager, but in his head is oh, like yeah. all these people do it wrong. If I was running it, like I do it right, so yeah. people are like, oh, he's a good middle manager ish. So I guess like he'll be a good manager, but they're assuming he'll just like he'll be like, oh, it worked when I was a middle manager, so we'll do the same thing. I'll just pick someone else to do my job, but instead he's just like, no, we're gonna change everything, and everyone's just like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So like yeah, it, yeah. It, that's because some I've heard one criticism is Ship of Magic is that again I don't agree with um, is that people like well how could they possibly think it would make sense to promote Ken promote Kyle but like it it does make sense he was a reasonably competent middle yeah. manager and is like married yeah. into the family and has quite a bit of experience like in hindsight yep. obviously it's like promote Brashen but their only source of information is about what's going on in the ship from the family is Althea and Kyle. And they have no reason to suspect that Kyle is as like unreliable of a source as possible. So they think Brashen's not very good at his job. So it wouldn't make sense for them to just be like, maybe that was yeah. the outline. Maybe in the outline, they were just like, okay, Brashen, you're obviously yeah. the captain now. But <laughs> then she's alone, writing but... it and she's like, no, that makes too much sense. So <laughs> <laughs> that's not realistic. <laughs> I'd be interested to know what you guys think about the fact that Ronica sort of manipulated Efron into leaving the ship to Kefria rather than splitting it and giving the ship to Althea and the lands only to Kefria. How did you feel about that? I don't know. Ronica <laughs> was <the> on <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Ronica was like also one of my favorite characters throughout the series because I feel like she yeah. always gave us like a very grounded um, point of view for the whole story. But at the beginning, because of that, I was like anti Ronica. I was like, she, it, like, in yes, I understand it was probably not the most like um, responsible decision to like make Althea the like captain of the ship. But I was like, she, like, if you guys have been leading her on, like, she should just get it. Um, so I was like very anti Ronica after that until like she grew on me later. It's also like when a decision goes bad, it's very easy to be like, okay, like that yeah. was dumb. Yep. But you don't know like the other decision could have also gone horribly. And then everyone yeah. would be like, that was dumb. Like, And yeah. at the time, like with the information she had, it, it wasn't always. Now it's kind of scummy to manipulate Efron. But yeah. in her head, it's like, okay, he's dying. Like he's not like I'm right now the person who needs to make this decision because I'm yeah. the one like of sound mind. He won't be um, the one to deal with those consequences. Yeah. And like yeah. she chose wrong, but I think it was like with the information she had, I think it was a pretty reasonable wrong choice to make. And yeah. also Ronica, I say like, you know, put her in any other series and she'd be like my favorite character in that series, but it's live ship. So she's like my seventh yeah. favorite character. Like yeah. <laughs> well, that, and she did, she knew that her debtors were watching them, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So she needed to make a decision that would look pragmatic to them. And she knew that putting her daughter, who might be a good, uh, like, as far as a sea worker, fine. But who is reckless and young at the head of the family's live ship would not signal to their, her debtors that they were in a position to pay back their, their debts. And I think that was a big factor in the decision. Yeah. And like, I would say with, pers with perfect information, she'd just be like, oh, yeah, Brashen should be captain. Yeah. But her only source on Brashen is Kyle. 
So yep. like she doesn't have the information to be able to make that reasonably. And also she has to consider the fact that making Brash and the captain would be an insult to the Trells. True. Yeah. I yeah. just yeah, I guess I just don't care about insulting the trolls, but she <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Jennifer Jennifer says Ronica recognized that the culture was changing that required a male family member to keep them legitimate. I think that's yeah. true. I think page the patriarchal society is a huge theme throughout the entire trilogy. And I think right from the go you have, you know, different generations of people trying to combat that patriarchal society that's you know, they are, as Chris is saying, their debtors are watching them. So the most pragmatic choice in that situation without any information from other, like what would happen or any in foresight of to what the repercussions would be for choosing one of the, over the other, it just, you know, makes the most sense. But, you know, I, it took me a while to really develop what I thought about Ronica and a number of these characters. I think like I was attached, I was like interested in them, but one way or the other, I didn't know where I landed until as we started making our way through the series. I yeah, found, like uh, yeah, I found Ronica and Kefria both to be completely infuriating. Um, yeah, I, I, agree. I see uh, Ronica almost as like a like a Tywin Lannister kind of figure. Uh, like whereas like the family is what matters, like the family's legacy, or in this case, our live ship, is what yep. matters. Like I don't really care about my kids. I mean, I'm sure she cares about her kids' happiness, but it's definitely second to keeping things running smoothly. Yeah. Um, I think the whole Kyle decision probably wasn't her worst decision. It didn't really work out very well, but I can see where she was coming from. I have more issues with like her, her parenting or grandparenting style with like Malta was I took huge issue yeah. with. And uh, a lot of like how she treated that servant girl or like the slave. Yes, that was my big issue with her in well. the beginning. Yeah. Yep. And her like just continuing friendship with Devad after knowing like what a... <laughs> Like, if you care about your family legacy so much that you're willing to do these things, but then you're also, like, yeah, tying your cart to Devon's horses. Like, yep. uh, I, I, I thought, don't know. It's just... I, th I thought her relationship with Devon was uh, kind of humanizing, mm -hmm. especially through, because um, mm. she was such good friends with the, the wife who died. Um, but I was really frustrated by her, who was a slave, whose name I've, I've completely... Uh, Rach? Yeah, rage. rage. Yeah, gotten yeah. cruel, but just in the sense that she really just didn't seem to be actually that out of slavery. <laughs> like she was just like, man, it's kind of annoying that Dava's <laughs> doing it, but like, mm, I guess I got to take her off my hands. Like, oh, but there was something about it that was a, a little bit cavalier. Um, yeah. But she, so she is somebody who she doesn't. I don't think she has the kind of sense of right and wrong in the same way that she's fervent and strident about it in the same way that somebody like Althea does. Um, yeah. And I think that's what mm. is kind of frustrating about her, um, you know, in, in these conflicts. Yeah. She seems very stuck. Like at this point of her life, she's very like stuck in her ways and she's not the type of person that you're going to change what she thinks very mm -hmm. easily. So like what she has, her views on the world at the beginning of the, of the book are going to be much harder to change than like someone like, Malta, who is much younger and yeah, experience it throughout the story. But speaking of Althea, what'd you guys think of Althea in book one? From I love over? book one Althea. I know, yeah. like, you know, not the best decision maker in terms of like she could have just gone to the other live ships, <laughs> but frankly, I don't care. And it, there's a scene in this book that I feel like if any other author wrote, I would just be like, I don't care about this, but it's a scene where like, she's on like the slaughter ship. And I really like yes. that subplot. Oh, yeah. And like, they go yep. to the Island and she's just been struggling with everything. And then she's like good at like butchering the animals, which is a really like weird thing to be like fist pumping at. But I remember when I read that, I was like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> let's go like you still got it. Um, and then I remember uh, like, the captain like she's like oh yeah can i get like the tags make it out to althea vestra and the captain like, gets, gets really mad at her and i remember being like wanting to punch that captain who we then never see again and raging yeah. at that captain on discord and people being like who even is this person and i'm like yeah. you don't remember them but they <laughs> suck trust me yeah um, it was so good that's one of my favorite I, sequences I was, as well yeah. it's like that's even the tension of that entire sequence, like it yes. constantly had the impression that like everything was about to go wrong. It, it was some of the most like tense subplots of a book I've read where like every page I was like, 
I remember like this this was a book that was pretty page turny for me. Like I had to keep reading. I remember yeah. being like scared to keep reading because I was like I was so sure that things were gonna go horribly. They kind of did. <laughs> but um and I was just like, I don't wanna I don't wanna read that happening. I love that for a Robin Hobb book, the big character win of the book is discovering that she's good at manual labor. Like that's the big win we get. That's our victory. <laughs> <laughs> But it was a victory. I I was yeah. like I remember I was, was like victory. I was yeah. extremely happy during that. Yeah, same. It's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah, it, it, it was empower. It was an empowering moment. Yeah. Um yeah. I always struggled with Althea. I always felt that she was so entitled. And I was yeah. like, check. <laughs> Meh. I liked that she struggled on the uh, whaling ship i really liked that i liked that it was hard and i liked that it was brutal and it was like yeah honey this is what everybody else has to deal with (laughs) and for her to just go yeah make out my tags to althea (laughs) i'm so clever and be so shocked when the captain is angry with her and i'm just like girl what did you think was going to happen there Really, but then I mean, also she's on. like, I mean, what is she, she can't say that the person's name that her name is Althea to start, or they won't let her on. And she also yeah. like, if she asks for the tags under a name that isn't hers, it's useless. So she doesn't really have an option yeah. other than like pretend to not be Althea and then be like, I need the tags for Althea. Like, she, <laughs> like it's not like she could have she done at any point. Go, this isn't gonna work. It's if, true. If I'm gonna do this. I have to do it as me. It's true she didn't consider hmm. like hey my only option still sucks um but yeah it was still kind of her only option. find a new plan <laughs> yeah that's true the new plan of going to the other live ships and being like hey yeah. let's, let's take this brand new live ship and make her a slaver or a slaver so like can we get on that can we do something about that yeah, yeah i love book one althea i think she's great um, I like the fact that she's kind of a mess. I like the fact that she's kind of dumb. Oh. That's why I like in characters, and that's why I love Robin Hobb. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, say one thing for live ship. There is not a character you can make at all a case that is a Mary or Gary Stu. Like, they are all no. messes. Oh, my God. Deeply yeah. flawed. And they're all messes. Well, like, most of them, you'd still be like, okay, you're probably, like, morally good. Like, they're they're not messes in, like, the... Like way where it's just like you're following people, except Kenneth, who are just like bad people. It's like okay, these are like these are people who are doing their best and are trying to be good people. It's just you know, trying yep. is sometimes step one to failing. So and that yeah. is uh, <laughs> true for basically all characters. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the character arcs in this trilogy are insane, especially Malta, as we we're touching on. I think Malta in book one just aggravated me, but I don't. I I think it was just. I don't know. I just every time I was on a chapter, I was annoyed and wanted to get to another character. Um, I, so think, that was... I, I think that's like part of Robin Hobbs, like mastery of characters. Just like like if you had told me during Ship of Magic that I would come to like Malta, I would be like, yep. there is absolutely no way. Like nothing she could do would redeem her. <laughs> um, and I did. So I was yeah. just like, like th- that's just like Robin Hobbs mastery of like our emotions <laughs> yep it's a funny thing to watch um because i haunt a lot of robin hobb threads it's always hilarious to me when new readers are coming into live ships and for the first half of ship of magic every comment is almost i hate malta she's so bad <laughs> awful i can't stand her and all of these people just wanting somebody to bitch slap her and it's like just wait just wait you're gonna love her so much and you're not gonna get the even funnier ones are people who have been like kind of minorly spoiled and know people like malta and they're like what how do you guys like and they're like i will never like this character and i'm just like yeah "Yeah, that's what they all say (laughs) (laughs) i think what frustrated me so much is she felt like a stereotype like she was like the stereotypical spoiled young girl kind of thing and i was like all these other characters feel so fleshed out and she's just annoying and then like it all made sense (laughs) she's uh she's not just like spoiled and annoying she's also so devious like yeah yeah. it's like holy crap i mean you cannot if she can find a way to like sneak around something she will i mean she's really smart but it's so frustrating (laughs) that's why i like her so much like one of my favorite like multi scenes is that she's the one person who just immediately sees through kenneth's horse crap 
Because yeah. she kind of is calculating similarly to Kenneth like, while right. not being like mm-hmm. Kenneth. Yeah. Uh, and everyone else like kind of buys what Kenneth's saying. And she just like right away, it's like, wait a second, you're doing what I do. Get the <laughs> hell out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I, said, I invented this. I have it trademarked. And you are in copyright violations. So. <laughs> I feel like, like Malta doesn't do it for like the like crazy psychopath reasons that Kenneth does his yeah, deviousness. No. Yeah, like, exactly. Hers are yeah. about like bringing her pleasure and things that she wants and getting her information that all these people are holding back from her. Like, yep. mm-hmm. I, I felt bad for her from the beginning because on one hand, you have like Ronica and Kefria like, oh, you need to grow up and you need to do all these grown up things. And so here's all this responsibility, but we're not going to tell you anything about what's going on. And we're going to talk to you like you're stupid. And so, of course, she's like, I'm not stupid. And I'm going to try and make things better for myself because no one else is clearly helping me. They're just using me to further the family's agenda and putting all this responsibility on me and not even explaining anything. So I felt super bad for her, yeah. like, you know, having been a teenage girl who people don't trust you with information, but still expect you to act like a grown up when you're literally a child. So uh, I yeah. could definitely relate to her, even in her like snarky little early <laughs> ship of magic yeah. <laughs> time frame. Like, I'm like, I, I get you, girl. I understand. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I, I got teenage Malta. <laughs> um, I, I liked Chris's point, though, where she is so clearly really clever. And I think that ties into the patriarchy theme and that she's not educated. So she's got all this intelligence that just has nothing to do. So Mm -hmm. yes, she's going to be manipulative. Yes, she's going to be devious. And as soon as the world around her changes and she actually has to start thinking about it, that's when we start to see her shift where she doesn't have time or energy anymore to worry about, I need to have the prettiest dress. Now it's, oh, I, oh, I get it. Okay, this is what I need to be doing. And she starts making that shift the second she sees the logic in it. Mm-hmm. And I loved that. That I loved that she was given that intelligence to go, oh, that's not important. Put that aside and yep. start making the more important decisions. I think the other thing to keep in mind with Malta is she's in a home where she doesn't have a... Um, clear chain of command if you like her mother is her mother that should be the person who tells her what to do kefria hasn't left home kefria is still a daughter in her mother's home so kefria is still looking for direction from ronica ronica does that because she is kefria's mother but doesn't feel she has the right to do that for malta expecting kefria to do it kefria is not going to do it because Ronica's in that role in that house. So there's a whole um, power dynamic where Kefri has never become actualized as a woman. She's never had her own home. Yeah. She's never been away from being somebody's child. So people um, have some criticisms that are very valid about the choices that Kefria makes, but they don't add in that factor that she's never left home. She's still mummy's little girl and mummy will fix it. Mum can help me fix it. I don't know how to do that because I've never left home and had to learn because mum does that at home where I live. Or, or and maybe the paragon dynamic. Kyle Haven will fix it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Kyle yeah. is like Malta's best like parental figure and he's probably not even there all that much yeah. he's off doing yeah. whatever he's doing but i think i think we see like well, maybe only mm. a couple scenes where where kyle and malta interact and if i remember he's like acts like a pretty good dad so mm. if that's if yeah, kyle haven is your you. like formative parent <laughs> yeah. figure like good luck <laughs> i'm amazed that we yeah. like you at all eventually like yeah that could have gone so yeah. wrong but yeah and that works for kyle as well that kid that when you think about it most people when they get married are going to say let's set up our our own house kyle's perfectly okay with kefria staying with her mother he likes her in that less in, uh, independent role that suits his view of the world he doesn't want her making decisions he doesn't want her with any sense of i actually don't need kyle to run my day-to-day life yeah. and so all of those things are just such um, established pieces of plot that you don't notice that they're part of the plot. Hobbs a genius. 
Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know. Yeah. And she, like, I mean, the character arcs, like, we always talk about how amazing they are, especially in this trilogy, because they're on full display with multiple people. But mm. she does it in a way that it's not, it's very gradual, even if you're not realizing it as it goes along the way. But by the end, you're very, you believe the, you believe the growth, at least for the most part, I would say. I think most people, a lot of people do. So it doesn't feel like, oh, this person feels like a totally different person than who you read at the beginning. It's like still very much the person. They've just grown based on whatever situation or thing they've yeah, they like, dealt along the way. I never, I never once felt like somebody was doing something like wildly out of character or anything. But yeah. if you looked at like what somebody did at the beginning of the first book and the end of the last book, you'd be like, those are not the same people. But like yep. the journey she takes you on is just like so well plotted that like I was never like, well, this is a weird turn. Like it just like made sense every step of the way. Yeah. And I was like, my favorite way of like seeing the live ship character arcs is that for the resolutions like of Ship of Destiny, for oh. the most part, like all of them if you told them their resolution at the start of ship of magic they'd be like oh no that's a terrible ending but then they get yeah. the ship of destiny and it's like oh no this is a pretty good ending uh, i think the only person who would be like kind of happy with the resolution would be like ronica at the start and obviously like mm -hmm. kenneth was not going to be happy with dying but Fair. other than that that's true for basically everyone where it's like wintro it's like yeah you're kind of the captain of a ship he'd be like no um <laughs> yeah. Althea would be like, Yeah, you're not sailing on the Vivacia, you're sailing on the Paragon. She'd be like, No, Malta, it's like, Yeah, you're married and to not the rain wild. <laughs> and yeah. she'd be like, No, but then by the end, they're all their priorities have like changed. Yeah, man. Robin Hobb is yeah. so good at character arcs that a piece of wood turns into a dragon. But, yep. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember reading the like um the like the little dust jacket thing, and it like it was trying to explain like the wizard wood to dragon thing. And I was just like, this book sounds what? wow. <laughs> I was like, what is this book even about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I mean, that's ship mad. I think we can start talking, move into the second two mad ship and ship of destiny. But I think the one thing I want to say is that I felt like each one of these books had very strong endings. Like I think the ending of each book mm. was, very strong like with ship of magic i think was the most explosive ending i think it just was i don't know with kind of taking over the vivacia and everything that was just i like blazed through the last 200 pages of that book because i yeah. just had to keep reading it but um that yeah was i think paced beautifully that tension was, into yeah. that that was that was yeah um, that was like a 3 a.m finish for me where i was just like yeah, like how do um, yeah, and you also like Althea finally getting a win with like the Ophelia yeah like yes um and man like Kenneth taking the Vivacia I was so conflicted I was just like on one hand <laughs> this means Kyle's <laughs> not running the Vivacia but on the other hand <laughs> it means Kenneth pirate ship so I was feeling very strong mm. emotions about that but like in every direction. No. This is really yeah. bad, but also really good, and I don't know what to think. The ending of yeah. Ship of Magic is one of my favorite endings she's ever written. When the second it got to the slave revolt, I was like, oh my god. Oh this, my is, god. this is really happening. And this, <laughs> yeah. oh, what's the guy's name? The point of view of like the first officer for Kyle, those are some of my favorite point yeah. of views. Oh my like, god, what's that guy's name? Yeah. Not Tor, Tor's Tor. the jackass. The guy who's like actually kind of likable. The ga um, ga oh, um, he was the guy was like, perhaps I was the one who was truly yeah, mad for like a key lay on my belt and I did nothing. Like the guy who, Gentry. Was, like, you know, Gentry, yeah, who is yes, like, yeah, yeah. you know, Gentry. oh yeah, maybe like, you know, if I start like giving one of them water, then like I have to see them as people. That's right. And he, yeah. like, like he started really realizing that and like mm -hmm. he started realizing, like, he, I feel like he would, he was like slowly realizing, like, okay, I can't do this. And then he just gets killed. And I was just yeah. like, See, and Miles really? gets killed. I was really upset when Miles got killed because I liked him. Yeah. yeah. And then random thing that was really funny when I think Wintro thinks like Skator is Kenneth, like he gets it mixed up. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, so yeah. Well, Sorko looks like the big pirate. You know, he's big and bluff, and he's got the the gold, and he's you know he's he's presenting that picture to the world. Kenneth literally just had half his leg legs. cut off. Yeah. He's still recovering from you know barbaric surgical conditions, and you know he's clear he he can't be a judge, obviously. 
Wow. And then I like when Vivacity is just finally like, you guys are not going to hurt Wintrow. Like her her monologue there. Oh, yes. So, anyway. Yeah. Love that ending. It's yeah. Probably yeah, I my favorite of the endings. I don't know. Yeah. I think one of the best, like, this I think is in Ship of Magic. There's a conversation between Vivacia and Wintrow. I think there was, I think it is Ship of Magic. There's like a whole chapter where they talk to each other. And I think it was after Wintrow gets tattooed and he comes back on the Vivay show with Kyle. I think there is a scene that I just remember being really powerful. But the yes. whole relationship <laughs> was just like so touching every step of the way. Even like yep. when it was fraught, it still felt like so real. So good. She ate his finger, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. She did. Yeah, she <laughs> but it was did. really nice. It was yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. very sweet. To pleased about. But... Yeah, it's a good good way to bond. <laughs> yeah, it was actually it was very it sounds bad, but it was actually very wholesome. Yeah, so. yeah it was nice. Yeah. So this is something that Hulk can do. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna have way. a magic talking yeah. ship that's gonna yeah. eat somebody's finger. Yeah, our two yeah. happy moments is one our protagonist has his finger cut off and eaten, and the other one is really good at butchering animals. That was nice. <laughs> 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 Aren't these such been, emotionally I, I, resonant, happy moments? Like we're really selling it yeah. right now. <laughs> if anyone everyone's <laughs> watching this spoilery review, <laughs> everyone's read it. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, it all feeds into itself too. Because if Wintro wasn't the troubled wee soul he is, then we wouldn't have that um, barrier between him bonding properly with Vivacia. and so that yeah. lack of a really tight bond allows Vivacia to sort of discover who she is without a really tight bond to a vestret. And so even just those elements there feed so much into everybody else's plots. So to have it all flow the way it does is just insane. It's so clever. Everything's just how it needs to be for it all to work. And I think that's why the trilogy as a whole works so well, because it does all fit together so tightly. It's just... I can't. I still can't find a fault with this trilogy. There's, there's nothing in there that shouldn't be. There's not stuff I think is missing. It just, it's a tight trilogy. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah, and for for when it all comes together, like you said, how how it all does come together so beautifully. I think that's like the the scene that stands out to me as doing that the best is Wintro freeing she who remembers. Oh, and, that's so good. Uh, yeah, that's the nice. whole so good. the yes. shore scene and getting back to the boat. I and, just got chills. Yeah, same. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, too. It's, just, it's so good. That's like easily my favorite scene in the series. Um, just blows my yeah. mind. Like, why is this serpent? Like, is it a sea serpent? Why is it sitting in a cave of its own acid? <laughs> like, who yeah. put these bars here? Wintro, what are you doing? And then, like, why is her skin stinging? Uh, and then. Uh, oh yeah, just so good. Like the fight with the others and yeah, uh, yeah, just yeah. I think that's why um, Mad Ship in a lot of ways kind of flips back and forth as my favorite because I think it's where you really start to see a lot of the the magical reveals start to come out more from what was introduced in Ship of Magic, mm-hmm. but they still leave stuff open for Ship of Destiny and later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get introduced mm-hmm. to you get well. I think we met Rain. In the in book one possibly, but book two is where you really see Rain and yeah. Cirilla and more of the you you obviously go to the Rain yeah. Wilds and it's just yeah yeah and where the story feels like it opens up. I think this we also get in Mad Ship Rain going to like the underground city. Is it's it's not uh, I can't remember yes. the, the yeah. name of it. So, and yep. he's like you know exploring the Elderling ruins and coming yes. upon yes. all the wizard with so logs. Cool. And so uh, cool. yeah, Tintalia is like talking to him in a dream, I think. And yeah, like, what, what yeah is like this? Malta goes down there, right? Yeah, and then yes. tries to you get like the, and then... the Malta and Rain uh, dream box. God, that's so cool. Yeah, yep. so it's just, cool. it gets so like mystical and weird and dark, but like, and like more tension keeps building because like the weird keeps happening uh, and intertwining <laughs> with the like familiar things of the people. And the yeah. more that happens and just the crazier it gets, uh, it's like, how is she, how is she going to do it? But you know, she's going to do it. So it's just oh, yeah. like the best tension because you have all of the trust in her to pull yeah. it off. 
Yeah. And then also for the back to the wind show, she remembers because then the consequence of that, like we get dragon Vivacia and some of the most like dead yeah. inside I have ever been while reading oh a book God. is like the Althea chapters in Ship of Destiny where she's talking about yes. rescuing Vivacia and then it cuts back and it's dragon Vivacia. And I'm just like, Bolt. Mm. Bolt. It's yeah. literally yeah. like Hobbs, okay. like, yeah, this entire, this person's like main primary goal for the series already failed. Yeah. Trashed it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, get wrecked. Yeah. Yeah. No chance yeah. of success. There's, I think it's the chapter. It's like chapter eighteen, uh, piracy in Mad Ship. I want to say, and it's like, um, it's almost like a Vivacia POV of like now that she's Bolt, and mm. just like the prose yeah. in it is like, oh, it's so good. It's like disgusting. <laughs> like it's like oh, so yeah. jarring. Yeah, yeah, she's like like gliding over the water, and her hands are like in claws, and her hair is like flowing behind her, and she's like. Piracy is awesome. It's like, yeah. It's so yeah. Good. yeah. And it's surprising. That's, that's when you realize actually live ships probably are the ideal pirate ships because they mm. are at heart predators. You know, Bolt is far truer to Vivacia than yeah. Vivacia is. Um, yeah, Vivacia is. A, point to a, someone else. She's a that's slave. a late character that's built of, of these family members and the people on board. Bolt is the being they made the ship out of. And I loved when she just was like, I'm going to be the best pirate ever. And she feels powerful again. And I loved that. I just loved yeah, She had her own yes. agency back. Yeah. 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 Of course, when she has her own agency, everyone's like, Ugh. we don't yeah. like it. Anymore. Also, the and thing that had me like on the most opium. Because, like, the reveal is the live ships are, like, an accumulation of, like, other people's memories. And I'm like, but they have such good psychological depth. How can you tell me they're not, like, people? But then it's like, yeah, maybe people yeah. are just an accumulation of, like, their experiences and memories. And that's why they feel like people. So who knows? Yeah. And then uh, we have Paragon yeah. as an example of this going really wrongly. Yeah. Yeah. Paragon. Yeah. I love Paragon. Paragon. We love Paragon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's my favorite of... of any of the live ship characters i love caravan yeah, because yeah. he's so brilliantly written brilliant you really his whole character arc. broken on the beach and you're just like oh <laughs> and he has that moment when the little boy in him calls out for his mother when the the matriarch of his family comes to tell him that no you're i'm selling you and yeah. the heartbreak in Paragon that his family are selling him. And I was just in tears. I was beside myself. I was just like, oh, how can they do this to Paragon? <laughs> Even though for the greater story, this needs to happen. You know, he and needs also, to be like, some, refitted and off you go. Mm. Some of those, like, heartbreaking Paragon scenes are, like, when he actually has, like, unconditional love for Kenneth because you really, like, he doesn't have a choice. Yeah. And it makes it, like, yeah. horrifying. Even, like, the unconditional love is becomes horrifying because yeah. you understand that he doesn't actually have a choice. And, yeah. and it's like, also, no when you see it. It, and then you're like, Oh yeah, Vivacia didn't have a choice about loving Althea or like Wintro either. And then it becomes more horrifying. And then I'm sad. Yeah. Yeah. So Para, 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 Another it's turn so I didn't see vision. coming. <laughs> Another, <laughs> my, my whole idea of live ships being turned on their head. Um, and also, I, I love when you reread the book, you can um, see kind of all the hints about Paragon kind of like threaded through. So like uh, yeah. at one point, um, Althea and Brashen have sex on the ship and Paragon registers it as something really horrible that's happened because, of course, he's um, experienced well, so he's much. Well, he's so confused. Yes. That it isn't horrible, that, that yes. this isn't about pain and it isn't about fear. And it actually, these people are experiencing good emotions and he's so confused by that and that tells you so much about his experience as a sentient being that mm. in all of the time he's been alive this is the first time people have come together with caring and the tragedy of that jeez just but you there's also um that when we discover, and again it is foreshadowed earlier, that he's made with two different Wizardwood logs. Mm -hmm. So not only have you got this really traumatic awakening, he's actually already broken. He's already two separate entities in the same vessel. This poor ship had no chance. 
<laughs> I'm just picturing he like, was going to be like, amazing I'm gonna from the make, beginning. I'm going to make my most tragic character a boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then like, it works. Add on the, the tragedy. Pool. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> let's make it let's make it hit us even harder by then carving him to look like yeah. fits. I was literally just about oh to say the same oh thing. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, so hey, do you guys know that uh, the fools in this book are in this book? Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. gonna ask that. <laughs> I've did seen you, people start Tawny Man who it? didn't know then and then were yeah. like, wait, this is it's being revealed? Like in, I didn't like, know yeah. it at first. I was talking to a friend and I was like trying to speculate i was like i'm pretty sure amber's gonna show up in other books and they were like yeah that's the fool and i was like wait wait, wait, wait. i was like i did oh, not wow. think about that. Yeah. yeah i had no idea i read them first so i had to make the connection when i read uh farseer and i remember when i read farseer the second the fool started talking i was like is this Amber's brother? The fool. I was like, I was like, wait, is this like another white prophet? That was my and, first. And then yeah. at one point, I was like, I mean, I think this was the fool, but the fool's obviously like, I'd forgotten he went a bit tawny. Yeah. The Assassin's I, Quest. I was like, the fool's like obviously really pale. And then I was like, wait a second, the next trilogy's called the Tawny Man trilogy. And I was like, okay, yeah. I didn't, I didn't make the connection fully until the fool got his fingers silvered, and then I was like, oh, um, I see. So yeah, I think for me it was uh, the Amber is like Amber has Burrich's earring. I want to say, or yeah. like the yes, uh, that's what kind of tipped it off for me. Uh, and then yeah. I think it, yeah, and then I was like, eh, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on, but I didn't want to you know call yeah. it for sure. But yeah. then uh, hits you with that line like, uh, I'm gonna carve you a face or carve me a face have... that you could yeah. love. And then uh, yeah. they're like describing like the broken nose and the axes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, help! Yes. And, yeah. yeah, and Paragon is like, you'd be a, you'd be like a, a fool to try and change the world. And Amber's just like, yeah, they've called me that like before. finger guns. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's <laughs> where. <laughs> that's where I was like, I was reading this at the same time with Pranav on Discord. For those of you who are on Discord, and he's way smarter than me. And he was like, he was like fairly confident. And I was like, but the fool was paying. And then I was like, oh yeah, Tony Man trilogy. So I kind of cheated because I was reading yeah. at the same time as someone who's smarter than me. So. <laughs> yeah. I had guesses I was going into. a bit into like Amanda, Shiba even Destiny. back then. Yeah. Did you? I, yeah. Uh, like, and I messaged in the Discord. I was like, I have a somewhat of a theory that I think Amber is the fool. Um, but it wasn't until like halfway through Ship of Destiny where she's like talking with Althea, I think, and is, is like, I've been called a fool and a prophet. And I was like, okay. Was you? I like <laughs> deliberately misleading nose. people. I, I think it might have been you where I was like, wow. I was like, interesting. I think you, I might have deliberately misled you. I enjoyed I think so. misleading no, people. No, because uh, you did. Because then I was like, oh, wait, that was probably stupid. Because I, <laughs> I, I remember there was someone else who, was who, when they were reading Farseer, and I've seen a few people do this, were really early in Assassin's Apprentice. They think Chade is the fool. And then when they're like, I think Amber's the fool. I'm like, hey, remember when you thought Chade was the fool? <laughs> 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 and they're just like, never mind. <laughs> um, which, of course, I'm not lying, but yeah, yeah. I, so I think I did that to a lesser extent. So I think Alex, you would have noticed earlier. I think you I deliberately know. misled you. So <laughs> I find it fun. So but, I, mean, yeah. I just go into books like so empty-headed. I try not to guess anything because I like to like be surprised. So it well, it took somebody else pointing it out. I'm sure I would have picked up on it in the next book, but like in this one, I was like, I just did not. It, everything just was like going right over my head. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, even the, I remember the first time no, I read it. Um, it was uh, like Amanda. I thought I was pretty sure, and I was pretty sure, and it was the carving of Paragon into Fitz. I'm like, yeah, that's the fool. And then I had a big moment where I was like, oh my god, it's the fool, and she's got this carved into Fitz. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a. <laughs> and that's then a fun... every reread, you're like, oh. The clues are everywhere. Yeah. yeah. One of those reveals where it's like once you can like once you start looking at it, like once you decide it's a legitimate possibility, it's like, okay, yeah. But yeah. it's like you have to get over a lot of hurdles to even decide like this legitimately could be a thing. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. The, well, the first time we see Amber, she's like carving, and we already know that the fool is good at carving things. Yeah, and it's also like, like her voice thing. is like really similar, right? Mm -hmm. Like her character mm -hmm. voice. And then she's described as tawny immediately. Like, yeah. yeah. I'd forgotten. I'd read Farsi a while ago. I'd forgotten the fool went tawny at the end. So I, I mm. was like, that's why I was like, is this another white prophet or something? Like, yeah. is this the same species as the fool? Yeah, Which that, yeah the I thought that that was the first thing. Like, oh, this is another white prophet. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
And also, by the way, if I see anyone on Discord be like, I think this is another white prophet, I'll absolutely be like, uh, not qu- I'll, be, I'll just tell them they're wrong because <laughs> I'm not lying. <laughs> it's not another white prophet. I can tell I like misleading people without lying when they're reading books. It brings me great joy. Um, if, if, yeah. Many of us have experienced you doing this to them. <laughs> yeah, well, it's fun. So I'm not going to stop. Yes. Yes. So what do you guys, what were your overall thoughts on, I mean, before we dive into like the big, I guess the, the big moment in Ship of Destiny that really a lot of people, a lot of readers really remember and latch on. I think overall in Ship of Destiny, what do you guys, do you like how the Mad Ship, tra- do you, did you like Mad Ship and Ship of Destiny compared to Ship of Magic? Do you like how it, the trilogy wrapped up and did you, I don't know, what are your overall thoughts on that third book and i think yeah i think that it's like one of the most satisfying endings to a series like i didn't feel like there was anything left unanswered that didn't feel intentionally left unanswered Mm -hmm. but like everything just felt so beautifully tied up and like i was so happy with everything like there was not one thing i was like i i I think it would have been better if it was done a little differently like everything was so there was one one scene that I'm sure everyone knows I'm talking about that was just like a off-putting um, and I think could have yeah. been done a different way with the same result. Yeah, but uh, otherwise I think like everything was stunning. Stunning. Yeah, I loved it. Um, I love the fact that everybody gets a bittersweet ending. I think that everybody yeah. finds a place for themselves, but they're, you know, it's not what they wanted. Um, I love the way that we end with, I think the tangle ends it. Yeah. yeah, I think so. The, the yes, lords the, of the, the final three... the... I think the yeah. final line is like the lords of the realm had returned. Yeah, the lords of three realms had returned. Yeah. It's like yes. the last yeah. line. Yep. Yeah. So aren't quite as iconic as the Fitz final lines, but it's true. still you know, great. Fitz um, final lines are high bar. So. Royal yeah. assassin final line. Yes. Oh my god, the royal assassin final the line. The one. So are we allowed to spoil Farseer here? I feel like we shouldn't because like some. I feel like we kind of. Like we've minorly, I kind of have. We minorly <laughs> yeah. spoiled things, but it's been like the full yeah. ghost haunt for all the other yeah, crazy really Chris's out there. Ooh, I guess if you're live ship first, yeah. I guess if you're listening and you haven't read Farce here, you really should have a read Farce. Read Farce here. Go read Farce here. Come back. Yeah. Note, everyone, yeah. Chris is a good role model when it comes to how much you enjoy Realm of the Elderlings. Not the best role model in terms of the order you read it, but I guess it's better <laughs> than skipping Live Ship, live ship first. So. But it, it's it's also yeah, a really yeah. great thing that we've got you, Chris, because you are able to go, well, I read it in this order, and this is how I experienced that going yeah, through, yeah. and the, the, the nature it, of how the reveals change. It's not ideal, but you will make the connections. Like I don't, I don't think I was more. Yeah. I never like completely missed anything. Like you, you do make the reveals. You just kind of backwards order. Yeah, and I, I mean, my, my because obviously I read Farsia first. I imagine that there must have been moments when you did go into Farsia where you're going. That's not what an elderling is. Yes, I already <laughs> know what that is, and I, I, and, I, and that's why I, I am quite vocal about no read farcia first because otherwise almost all of their objectives you already know aren't real <laughs> you know, yeah that's what are they one doing yeah. this whole thing readers. is a waste of time yeah new um, readers it's just like you know the meme format of like is this something it's just like new readers like literally anything is this an elderling <laughs> like, yeah. like is the fool an elderling is Jade an elderling or dragon's an elderling or every long elderling. time to figure out what an elderling was like even at the end of this trilogy yeah. i did not understand it i was like no kind of yeah i think <laughs> i like, vaguely kind of, I yeah well, that's because you figure out on a wrong idea. like three times yeah, yeah. yeah. i didn't also, yeah. fully understand so not it quite sure. like, mm. one thing that's kind of funny people like will ask me like oh does live ship spoil farseer and i'm like i mean technically but you have to really be paying attention yeah you yeah, wouldn't get it. really know because <laughs> at some funny. point in ship of magic like they talk about like the stone dragon like they yes. casually mention the yep. stone dragons yeah. thing and i'm like okay so like if you're a genius you might remember that but like you're not <laughs> so you'll be low. fine no. yeah 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 my biggest issue well, is genuinely that you're just aware of the fact that the big mission, the big overarching aim you're going for, you already know isn't 
valid? Yeah. <laughs> How are you yeah. supposed to get invested in this story if you already know this? So that's that's where I come from on the whole. Please read Fuzzy. Just read it in publication order. <laughs> yeah. And if for yeah. some reason you don't <laughs> want to read it in publication order, fine. Live ship Farseer Tawny Man Rainwilds Fits in the Fool is like the the least bad of the other options. Just read, just read also, Rainwild. we're not the book it. police. It's in the full And version. if you read... <laughs> yeah, just start just with Fool's Assassin. Read what you read. Yeah. We're all intelligent enough to go, oh, okay, I wasn't supposed to know that yet. And yeah. we can all put it in order in our heads, Chris, clearly. <laughs> yes, the story will make sense. So, yeah, we're not the book police. We're, we're basically just saying... We want you to love it as much as possible. And to do that, read them in this order. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I and also, if you like... don't, I might have crossbowmen shoot you. Um, <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, I didn't mean to, like, ask the overall thoughts on Ship of Destiny, right? Did flip-flop stuff, but I think it's really good to know because I think, as we were talking about earlier, when it comes to just the character arcs in the overall trilogy and how everyone changes so dramatically... From book to book to book i think mad ship is really where you see malta coming to her own in the second half i think that and it's also where wintro kind of takes a step back even though he has some really good moments in mad ship with kennet i specifically um but i think moving into ship of destiny from mad ship malta was like already i liked her significant i just liked reading about her significantly more than i did mm -hmm. in ship of magic and then winter i i still enjoyed i just like didn't feel like we were seeing as much of, and I think we were introduced to some other things like Cirilla and the Satrap and that whole plot line with the Bingtown um, politicking that was going on was very interesting, but that all leads to Ship of Destiny, which is where you really see where all the characters end up and how their expectations are not what they expected at the beginning of the trilogy. Uh, but I think it, we can kind of <laughs> talk about probably the biggest scene that everyone talks about when it comes to ship of destiny and to be honest i kind of exp i was reading in discord you can always tell people's reactions when they're like this book chapter whatever and then all the reactions are like oh yeah that's where i had to put the book down so like i knew that something was coming but i didn't expect myself to have as visceral that. of a reaction <laughs> as i did because like i don't think when kennedy assaults althea and three quarters of the way through a ship of destiny. I think that was probably the most, again, just the most visceral of a reaction I've had while reading a book. Like I was surprised at how emotionally reactive I was to that. I remember you messaging me and being like, I might have to read something else tomorrow. I, take I was a like, breather. Holy <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, heavy. that's like the scene that I, I think just because it was on the page, um, it just felt it felt like it was like too far for me. Like as a reader, I was like there, I, I feel, I understand why she did it. And like, I get that it was to make Kinnett irredeemable, but I feel like it could have been done in a different way. That was less. Um, I don't know. I, I just think that's one of those things for me that I don't like seeing in books. And I think that's just a personal thing, um, but it was really hard for me to read very hard yeah. and i think that was intentional but it was tough yeah. yeah yeah it was really shocking for me um yeah and i don't i mean i think part of it was to make kind of irredeem irredeemable but i think kind of the biggest statement the book is making is there's actually quite a few instances um which you don't even realize actually on the first reading sometimes of really heinous sexual violence yeah. um and you kind of I don't want to say you excuse it as a reader, but you kind of gloss over it. It's very like just kind of a background Cirilla. part of the world. And I feel like her big statement at the end of the book is like, you've excused enough, you know, you're going to watch this now, you know, um, and this is the full realization of this world that you yeah. have, you know, you excuse Cirilla because she wasn't very likable at the beginning and she really kind of got herself into that mess. Now, didn't she, you know, all that different, yeah. like, mind tricks the game the books play on you as you read them um so i mean it's obviously everyone's mileage with that subject matter is going to vary but i feel like that was the statement the book felt like it was trying to make for me when i was reading it mm -hmm. and it's I like, like oh have you been mad way. at sorella for like this book well yeah 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 I, although i i thought sorella's stuff in like ship of destiny 
where she like her entire goal was like to get to Bingtown, and then because of like what she's gone through now she's there and she's almost losing it because like she just won't see Bingtown mm-hmm. like as her allies yep like i thought that was brilliant and i think it tied in so well with which earlier when I said like there's another moment where I came even closer to throwing a book across the room, it's the closest I've ever come to throwing a book. I've never thrown a book while reading it, but like oh, I, have. I did the motion and then like <laughs> held on. My arm tried to throw up, but I, I barely saw it myself. And, um, yeah. And then yeah. I'm so disappointed in Wintro. Yeah. Like you were my that boy, Wintro. That was like, half of the bad. Yeah. Come on, man. But it was like how everyone treated Althea after that scene was. Yeah. Including was- Vivacia horrific yeah. and only etta being there for her was just like so oh and etta's yeah. and etta's like it's it's easy for her to believe it because like etta has had such this messed up sexual relationship with kennett that yeah. like like chris was saying like we overlook all these like smaller um things that have been happening this whole trilogy uh and i think the the etta and kennett relationship is is one of those things like because we like etta's cool like she's an, she's a really interesting character kennett is extremely charismatic like uh so i don't know it, it doesn't feel as visceral as like mm-hmm. you have like althea althea is like completely helpless on yeah. uh with kennett like he has her drugged she's locked up like she has yeah. nothing um whereas etta you know she's like a badass she has like knives and uh so it's like it, it doesn't feel as bad, but like the way that it is bad. The way yeah. that yeah, the mm-hmm. way that Kenneth treated Etta the whole time has been terrible. Or yeah. look at like um, I know people talk about this probably quite a lot, and it's it's not nearly as awful as the way Kenneth treats women. But like even like Malta's what like thirteen when this twenty year old guy yeah, comes to was- marry her, yeah. and. Uh, it's not even seen too much as like a like it's a business partnership but they fall in love and uh rain is cool like we like rain he's like a really interesting dude and at this point we like malta so we're kind of overlooking that or um the way that uh kefria and kyle's relationship is like kefria always thought that their sexual relationship was one thing and Mm -hmm. kyle Mm -hmm. saw it completely differently and like tells her one night and like shatters her whole perception of their relationship so yeah i think um what Derry was saying about how this book is like so themed around patriarchy and yeah. how women survive in this world all it all really comes to a head with um the scene with althea and kennett and it is so hard to read and so it's just been building up tension the whole yeah. time because like she wakes up in there and then she realizes she's drugged and it's this like will he won't he kind of just like pit in your stomach and then mm-hmm. when he finally does it's like there was he was always going to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and like his too, reasoning, goes, yeah, like, his reasoning behind it with like the Wintro thing. And it was just like so, so gross and so mm-hmm. hard to like get through. And, and I've probably read books that had more scenes of sexual assault and even probably yeah. some that had more violent sexual yeah. assault scenes. And yet I found this one the most upsetting mm-hmm. of any I've ever read. Uh, yeah. It's very psychological. It lasts a really uncomfortably long time like you know you yeah. do get to the point where like please end this scene um so yeah it's i mean the trigger warnings are like definitely warranted oh, yeah. it's not yeah. an easy read at the end yeah um <clears throat> i mean really agree, <laughs> i agree jennifer um, yeah chapter 26 because that's the chapter is incredibly triggering and I've, I've talked to a lot of people, obviously, over the years about this whole chapter, and, and a lot of women have a lot of different reactions to it. They don't want to see it. That's not, I don't want to read it. I've been through this, don't want to read it. I think why it is so visceral and so emotional is that it is written exceptionally well. It is written in a way, if this is too much information, world, I'm sorry. I, I have had a very similar experience in my past. This, thanks to lots of therapy, didn't trigger me. But reading it, it was, I could just go, this is right. This, this, mm-hmm. the, the, the disorientation, the, I should be frightened, but I actually am so drugged, I'm not. This, it was frightening. And the yeah. fear of it. And it was beautifully written. And it is in your face, as Chris very excellently put. You've accepted the previous moments of 
you know, violence toward women, sexual violence toward anybody, because, you know, we've, we've seen and heard of instances where young men have been attacked. And we've kind of gone, oh, okay, and carried on with the story. This is saying, no, stop. This is something horribly tragic that is happening to somebody that we care about, that has happened to these characters you don't necessarily care about, but this is their experience. And then in the aftermath, it's also dealt with exceptionally well because this is how people react. It's shocking and they don't want to deal with it. And it's not that they're being cruel. It's not that they're going, you're a liar. They're going, I can't deal with that truth. So I, I, I don't want to even talk to you about it because I, I'm not ready to face what that means for my relationship with this person. Mm -hmm. Etta gets it because she knows the layers that people have around sexual mm -hmm. interactions. So Etta gets it immediately. She's like, yep, that happened. For Wintro, he's only spent a few months with Althea his whole life. And he's formed this bond with Kenneth that's very paternal in terms of mentorship and caring. And to hear this new hero who's given him this new lease of life could do this, of course he's going to go, I don't want to reframe this relationship. That mm, I don't want. And that's a very real response from people. Yeah. The the disbelief that they're not wanting to go there. And we've all seen it, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it, it happens. This is the, the usual reaction that, that comes. The good, bad, uh, how do we put it? The the brokenness of Kenneth that we address later doesn't change that moment. And that moment is when you realize that you wanted a redemption arc because at this moment, you know you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. I felt on my first read so betrayed by Kenneth for that. I was like, no, you were doing all of these good things. Yes, your brain was broken, but you were doing good stuff. You're supposed to turn into the hero, a good guy, you know, and you've let me down in a huge way. Yeah, and oh, it's like reading. every time I'm I see Kenneth yeah, from like was other people from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and like before yeah. that scene, obviously, but like from Wintro's yeah. point of view, like in Ship of Destiny, if you didn't have Kenneth's point of view, you'd think he'd be doing a redemption arc. And I've described <laughs> Kenneth as like, he's someone who starts as a villain and yet he still has a corruption arc. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like if, if you were yeah. like, there's yeah. people's reactions to Althea, like are very, very realistic. And mm -hmm. like, think about like, I can't imagine mm -hmm. that say we didn't have Kenneth's POV and we only knew him through the indirect characterization of all these other people. Would the reader believe it? If that was something that Althea came out with, if we didn't have yeah. Kenneth's, POV, I, I, I'm sure there are readers that be like, oh, Kenan didn't do that. Like, mm -hmm. just based yeah. on whatever he else seems means. like. So, like, and yeah, and obviously, like, Wintro doesn't, like, that's where Wintro's coming from. Like, Wintro's yeah. like, but I, yeah. but I like Kenan. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's yeah, taking yeah, care of me. This person he likes has, like, deceived him. Mm -hmm. um which it's kind of like uh, yeah. even though i think it's like even from winter it's brilliant characterization it's still just like i'm still so disappointed in you intro like i think what you're my favorite i i won 100 was like full-on sobbing when paragon took the pain for out oh, yeah. i was I know, literally yeah. like full-on tears sobbing i was like this is wild <laughs> he's such a good character at how did you feel about that a lot of a lot of reaction um doesn't like that he took that um i, I can thought, see so it like to hear yeah what you guys yeah I, I can see it both ways because like i i just found it to be very touching his intentions whether what he did was good or not he is saying i've taken other people's pain i can handle yours too and i just thought it was like so such a touching moment i don't know if what he did was good or bad um but i think it was sweet at least caring i agree yeah i don't know if because obviously it contrasts with like fitz gives puts his pain yeah. into like i was just about to say the same dragon thing. um yeah. and i don't want to talk too much about because obviously you guys are going to have more stuff with fitz no this um, could come. this possibly come up again um could that huge decision he made be relevant probably no not. way 
Robin It'll Hobb probably never come up again. I'm sure no. it's not. No um, foreshadowing. <laughs> so they will definitely, this will definitely never come up again. So <laughs> we can just put this to bed because it's not going to be relevant. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like if it wasn't okay for Fitz, why is it okay for Althea? Or not okay for, but like why yeah, is that? Yeah, because I, I do see some people kind of go like both ways. Like, because it's, I think it's like you can make the case either way for both. Mm -hmm. um but it, it does, was definitely like it was very like from paragon's perspective i'm like oh that was like that's really sweet of paragon and mm -hmm. i love paragon and i still think he's like yeah. maybe like even the most tragic hob character and he's a boat i'd say um, literally a boat <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think you're right though like we we get to like see both options through farseer and through mm -hmm. live ship we get to see uh the consequences of both decisions so that's interesting because you can justify both of them uh and uh yeah it's, it's interesting to see like uh the differences and not one being like oh this is the right way to do it over the other one like people are no, gonna make the choices like, that they make fitz was like fitz was really pouring stuff in there like fitz had to be stopped fitz like yeah, he started with like the really bad <laughs> yeah, stuff He's no, like, I okay, was so like, i got tortured enough. and i'm like hey. okay understandable yeah. and then he starts being like oh and i didn't know my parents i'm like fair and then he's like and this relationship stuff was on and i'm like uh. and then he's like oh yeah and my uncle and regal was mean to me and i'm like uh, okay <laughs> this bread um, was a little too crunchy one time out there, which is yeah, like geez. okay this was horrible we'll just put this in and then like we'll stop. the rest of the stuff yeah. may have sucked but like the rest of the stuff was sucked, but like is important for who I am. This I'm just put it behind me if possible. Yeah. 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 The the reason I ask is um the obviously one of the other themes of the trilogy has been trauma and actually dealing with that trauma and integrating trauma to move past it. And there have been people saying it's just been taken away from Althea. What is that saying? And I want to just make the point that Paragon doesn't take away her trauma. He takes mm -hmm. away the the shame and the um, uh, the feeling of worthlessness. So he doesn't take away the event. He doesn't take away the trauma, obviously. So she still has to do that. She still has to do her own integration of what's happened to her. And he's literally just taken away the awfulness, like the, the real pointedness of that trauma and i've i've looked at it and I've, I've spoken to my therapist about this scene <laughs> when that basically and the way she put it is that the, the ship because she's not attached to paragon the way i am she said the ship has just fast forwarded her through probably two years of just coping with how that feels she he, the the ship has taken away the intensity of it so that she can actually be more aware of yeah. her reactions and i thought in hindsight reading it however many times it was the next time i read it going yes that makes sense to me that fits how she's behaving afterward that fits what paragon is saying to her and i just thought it was so beautifully done but i totally get the visceral emotional reaction that this area of the book gets because it's in your face and that's a yeah. really good explanation because i've always felt like i've always had like the intuitive impression that like when fitz was doing it i was like this feels wrong and when althea was doing mm. it like it felt right and i've always felt like that was contradictory in my head and i thought that was like mm. a really good explanation but i really appreciate that because i've never been able to articulate why they yeah. feel <laughs> different yeah um yeah. also obviously you need to just this is you need to be like therapist to do your job properly you're gonna have to read the live ship training i guess you have to read <laughs> all of the yeah. here. <laughs> like if you don't I'm working i on think it. yeah <laughs> I'm working and on actually farseer so we can compare it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm working on it so oh, I speaking of was, yeah an interesting thing mm -hmm. yeah speaking of paragon i think um ship of destiny Mad ship too, but ship of destiny is really where you can see why people have Paragon S as, as their favorite character of the trilogy. I mean, he's the most, I would say in a lot of ways, he's one of, if not the most tragic character of the trilogy. And especially when you start realizing, oh, he's a love luck, all his connections to Kenneth and all the abuse that he's had to take in because Kenneth has poured it into him. And then even at the chance when Kenneth, you know, has the opportunity to bring it back, he refuses and tries to get paragon to basically commit suicide and that whole scene of scenario of the book like 
got me. Just tragic. And I was, <sighs> what do you guys think about, what do you guys think about that whole dynamic as you learn more? And when did you know that P Paragon was a Ludluck? I well, think I, think I, I kind of was, 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 was a Ludluck. Kind of, yeah. I don't yeah. think yeah. I figured yeah. that out. Yeah. I think I got that when he, I was directly told. I, yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't catch on. On the on the reread, you notice a lot of hints being dropped because Kenneth keeps talking about the luck in his name, yeah. um, and that's something I only picked up when I reread it. Um, but yeah, mm. I, I also had to be basically <laughs> told. I, I get one basically. <laughs> I make one good prediction per big series. Yeah, and this was not it. <laughs> <laughs> Realm of the Elden Rings, it was mostly in a later book. I got a lot of stuff from Fool's Assassin. Not not these. These, I was yeah. like, I'll, I'll figure things out when I was directly told. Except, um, or when the smarter person who was reading it with me <laughs> pointed it out. And I was like, oh yeah, that does make sense. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does help to have somebody buddy reading these with you to help point out stuff. Because there is so much stuff mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. these books. I mean, I mean, even just this discussion things. right now, you guys are teaching me things I didn't pick up on. So yeah. I also oh, it helps yeah. that Pranav is smarter than me, so he's a good person to to go with. Also, hey Pranav, if you're watching this, start a channel. Come on, <laughs> seriously, do this for ages. You said you would. You did a video with on Evie's channel, and then you just yeah with me. Yeah, and yeah, that was my first live stream. Um, the uh, the themes. Even just the themes alone, we haven't touched on the fact that it talks a lot about fathers in the same way that Farsia did, where you've mm -hmm. got boys being mentored and fathered by men who aren't their father. So you've got Wintro and, and Kenneth with Wintro and Kyle and, and the juxtaposition of that. And you've got Ephron over, I mean, okay, Althea's not a boy, but she's in a, a male role as his child on the boat. There's that parenting, fathership, and generational um, uh, disconnect. The themes are just insanely crazy in Life Ships. There are so many things going on in this trilogy. It's madness. We haven't even talked about the rain wilds. I mean, for new or readers, down. I mean, for you guys, well, I mean, what do you guys think about rain wilds and and? What have you taken away from that moving forward? What is the Rain Wilds? Knowing there's a later series called the Rain Wilds. I feel like <laughs> I'm going to accidentally spoil things if I talk about Rain Wilds. So Jordan, you want to we'll go? Not say anything. Uh, I honestly don't have many predictions because I want to be surprised, so I try not to think too hard about it. Um, but I did love, like, all of the scenes, like, all of that underground stuff when we were learning about the elderly. So I was like, this is so cool, especially because we were, like, only given, like, a little morsel here and there, and then everything else was just like, I have no idea what's going on. I was eating it up. I loved it. But I, I don't have predictions for where we're going with it, really, <laughs> other than yeah. what we were directly told. <laughs> Yeah, I, I absolutely love the Rain Wilds. And I also think it's that and the the Mountain Kingdom from Farseer, I think were my two favorite places out of the two trilogies I've read so far, just because they feel the most different from any other fantasy I've read or any yeah. other story I've been reading, at least recently. And so the scenes in Mad Ship specifically with all the Rain Wilds was just, I loved everything about it. When it comes to predictions about it, I don't know because I don't really know if I fully grasp what an elderling is. So yeah, I'm same. still kind of discovering that. <laughs> and so that um, I do predict that we'll see characters again. And I'm sure we'll see, especially because of the Rainwild Chronicles, I'm sure at least one or two of the characters from Live Show Traders will make an appearance or be there. Or yeah, I'm wondering like how, how much. Like, is it just going to be like a shout out or are we going to like, are they going to be characters in the like full plot of the story? Yeah. Well, by the way, for not really having a good idea what elderlings are, that means you're paying attention. So good job. <laughs> if you were really confident, yeah. I'd be like, no, oh, <laughs> might have read something. <laughs> right? You really shouldn't be that confident. Uh, also, for DK Moon's comment, I think considering you, you're still getting in between them, um, yeah, yes, kind of is a buffer, like a bit of a damper on that. Um, because Chalcid yeah. are, yeah, because Chalcid just fights Kyle, with everyone. Just like. An, like a good for above average dude from Chalced, like 
Yeah. Uh, I'm going to like thematic. Like, yeah. This is, I think my favorite, like thematic, two thematic things in live ship that I think are particularly strong in live ship, even compared to the other trilogies is how it explores like how so much of like the bad things that happen in live ship are caused by complacency. And so many people's default is to just think of themselves like, uh, I mean, like, there's bad things happening, but as long as I don't actively contribute to it, and even if I do actively contribute it, I mean, it would still be a thing anyways. Like, this is Devad's whole thing. He's like, I mean, people are going to have slaves anyways, so, like, yeah. what does it matter if I hop on the bandwagon? Um, make most of it. And, uh, like, that and that was one of the reasons why I thought, I have already forgotten his name again, but, like, the like Kyle's, like, number one dude who doesn't suck, who has the point of view why I like him so much, he was slowly realizing, like, by participating, even if I'm not actively choosing, like adding to it, just by participating it, like I'm part of the problem. Um, and the other is if it focuses on like the status quo a lot and how people are so attached to the status quo, like even if the status quo doesn't have any actual like value compared to like a different, like also fine thing that's going on. This is something like Ronica talks about and I really like it where it's she she has conversation with Cirilla, how she's just like, you know, just because this is how things were doesn't mean like that's good like that's like don't think of it like that way like we should be trying to like advance things from the status quo like we shouldn't be trying to get back to the status quo which i think is like mm. a lot of the characters in this trilogy like are really attached to like just what they're used to and i think that's true for yeah. human nature in general and those are my two favorite like other than the really obvious ones of like like there's some really clear like patriarchy feminist themes that i think like basically everyone who reads it takes it away and then i feel like everyone has like a different two big ones those are like my two that i yeah. really love yeah. and it's one of the reasons i think it's going to stay my favorite yeah that and the expectations how like everyone just had a set of expectations at the beginning that was challenged and then they every single person yeah i believe ended up totally different in a totally different spot than where they expected they were going to be at the beginning yeah. Yeah, I, I have what watched I think, a like, live stream where someone was really about that <laughs> i was like um but what that person wanted at the beginning it's totally not possible by like halfway through book two yeah. and that person was still just really really angry about the fact that well that's how i wanted the book to go i was like kind of not the series fault no, uh, this is, yeah this is not, life. Like, not the book for you <laughs> yeah. i think that was literally like jimmy's like goodreads review it's like this is a series about like expectations and like for what happens when like those expectations yeah. just are not plausible yeah. anymore yep. um yeah and accepting which, that and going okay see jimmy i'm representing you because you couldn't make it if you come back and watch this later <laughs> um, everyone don't forget to don't uh don't stop turning the page ah oh, Keep turning the page. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Keep, Keep turning, turning the page, that. everyone. Yeah. So are you, when are you guys going to move on to Tawny Man, do you think? Uh, I, I think, think we're Alex both starting Jordan? it this month. Yeah. Good choice. Definitely going to read Fool's Errand this month. Yeah, uh, how, so how fast I move through it. I'll probably move it through it pretty quick. I'm probably, yeah, I'm probably going to be like one of Realistically. <laughs> I know myself. Fool's yeah. Errand is, to be fair. Best from the elder link. That's what I, a really lot of people good. have said. It's that, my favorite. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> Tawny Man. Tawny Man is probably the, the most disparate of the trilogies in that it's sort of one book and then two books. At the end of Fool's Errand, you're going to be like, eh, okay, without that sense of this story is halfway through and I need to find out what happens next. Fool's Errand kind of has its own little thing and Golden Fall and um, False Fate have like a, their thing. So it's a, it's an oddly paced little trilogy for that. Funny because actually, when but, you think of, when I think of it described as like one book and then two books, the the, the only trilogy where I don't think of it like that is Farseer because I feel like like Ship of Magic really? like I can tell you for every character where Ship of Magic ends and then for Mad Ship wow. or Ship of Destiny they kind of feel like one really big story, um, mm -hmm, yeah. and then the same thing for Tawny Man like Fool's Errand I feel is very distinctive, yeah. and then yeah. for Fitz and the Fool Fool's Assassin I think of like I think of as its own thing. Although Fitz and Fool, I think like each three book, like I can tell you where all three end, like, and and mm. I mean Farseer as well, just because I mean, Fitz books it's easier because it's one point of view, and I mean it's pretty easy yeah. to remember where <laughs> Royal Assassin ends because yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cause of, yeah yeah anyway, but I kind of think of a few of them like that's kind of a good way of describing it. Yeah, I love yeah. Tanya. Fool's Errand is going... like one of the my three oh. favorites. Yeah, Fool's Errand is really good. Seriously? Fool's Fate, though, is my favorite of all time. I'm probably in the realm of the other links. I love that book. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh, the emotional payoff in that is ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, 
was I going to say? Are, oh, are you going to read the novella before you go into Fool's Errand? The Wealthy uh, Princess the and the Wilful Piebald Pen. Prince. Yeah. It's really good. I, Should I? I yes. want to, but I haven't, I haven't been able to like, for some reason they've been backed up on Amazon for so long. So like, I can't find so, a copy. And then this I, is where just, I've heard two perspectives. Library. And, um, <laughs> so Derry, after reading it, she recommends reading it before Tawny Man. Um, yeah, because then you kind of know a little bit more what's going on for Tawny Man. And then I kind of also like reading it after Tawny Man because there's some things mm -hmm. where if you read Willful Princess after you've read Tawny Man, you can see like the rippling That's out consequences. Good, yeah. So I've yeah. come to the conclusion that the true cool, 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 the true cool way to do it is to read it before and after Tawny Man. Don't like worry. a real cool person. <laughs> I've never read it. You should I'm read not going to argue it's with that. It is really good, Chris. It it's is. really good. And it's it's actually like, um, I've said the funniest thing about the book, other than like, it has like, you know, it's got really good characters and a really good story and all that is uh, it's taking place hundreds of years before Fitz is born. And yet you can still like see how things will end up causing pain to Fitz. So Hobbes still finds a way to dump on Fitz in a book that takes place <laughs> hundreds of years before he was born. Incredible. But it's, it's really fantastic. Like I, I would. Um, it's I'd a short little book. It, it won't take long to get through. And it's, it's it's just it just adds a really lovely bit of depth to what's going to go on. In, I just always forget it exists. Particularly full Me too. I've you always been so bad. <laughs> I've always been so bad about reading novellas and series anyway. Like I'll go back and be like, oh, there was like yeah, three same. novellas. Well, I mean, it's not necessary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't have to. Yeah, but it, it's, it's not really necessary. Good, like, I mean, it wasn't published. You know. Yeah, yeah. it's one it, of my it favorite published like, until novellas much later. In general. So, um, yeah. And also, I think a lot of the time, like, novellas come up in series, because a lot of the time there's, like, a really clear place where you should read them. Uh, and Piebald Prince, it's, like, it's maybe better it's it's better to read it right before Tawny Man. Maybe it's better to read it after Tawny Man. But you can kind of read it whenever. Um, yeah. Like, it doesn't spoil any of the other books, and it works yep. without any of the other books. Like, I know someone who literally read it first, just because they were like, I feel like trying Cobb. And I yeah. want him to read it again, because I feel like if he reads it now, like being my favorite thing about the novel is seeing like how the events like impact future people. And like, it's kind of like feeling of the butterfly effect in trying time travel novels. But this yeah. is like, I mean, your actions, small things can still have really long lasting impacts, even if you aren't a time traveler. And it's kind of like the butterfly effect, but you know, we're not a time traveler, but we like as the reader, like can see, Get to see how these small moment. or, or big or petty or like decisions that make sense at the time all can ripple out and have these effects for people hundreds of years later. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Would recommend. That's well said. Looking it up right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I guess to wrap up the uh, the discussion, I think I guess one last question for everyone. I don't know if you may not have this an answer for this, but who is your favorite character of the trilogy by the end of the trilogy? I'll answer because no one else that is. we like <laughs> for our favorite so character. Your arc. favorite. I'll oh, take Althea. That's another question. I'll take Althea. Um, <laughs> good... I think two books in, I would have said Wintro, and yep. Wintro is my favorite character for two of the three books. But Althea is like close second for both of those, and then like pretty comfortably my favorite for Ship of Destiny. Tenet, I think, is the most complex, yeah. but I just I hate him. Oh yeah. So yeah. it's hard for her, so I'm not putting him above. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Paragon's a good pick as well. Yeah, Paragon yeah, would probably Paragon. take up, like, would make up the top five. But they're also good, but I'm taking Althea as my favorite. Um, I'm going to say Malta. I love her. Um, <laughs> That's mine. She, yeah, by the end of the trilogy, yeah, I think she's cool. just fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't Gotta know. go with Malta, too. Malta and, uh, yeah, I, I love I love Tintaglia, the dragon. Oh, yeah. Just love her. She's two for me, but in dragon form. <laughs> in dragon form. <laughs> but I like the dragon wishes. Yeah, yeah that Tintalia is basically has the same self image that my cat has of herself, except Tintalia is actually kind of right. That's the only <laughs> hey, your cat is my cat's kind of right as well. She's pretty glorious. Yeah. She just, you know, isn't yeah. actually powerful. Doesn't have wings or talons. No. Yes. Yeah, I think mine what about is you, Jordan? like tied between Malta and Paragon, I think. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if I could well, choose. Paragons, They're yeah. so good. Yeah. And Alex? It's mine. I, mine's Malta, I think. And then Paragon's close second. And then Kennet was like my favorite. Kennet was the, way. like, yeah. Like, a, the, the one I, yeah. honestly, the one He's I thought a masterpiece. about the most. Yeah. yeah. 
The one I've thought I back on the most. I considered just being contrarian and being like Brashin because everyone forgot about him. And then I, I was always go on this long him. monologue of how good of a character Brashin <laughs> is. is, which like would be true because Brashin <laughs> is a brilliant character. I just like like seven or eight other live ship characters more. They're yeah. all like so like there's not some... one person that's not fleshed out. <laughs> no. We had some serious oh, Brashin thirst so going good. on. <laughs> yeah, Maybe, did you read Fresh are you fist. doing are you doing the me way or the dairy way for piebald prince <laughs> actually the real me way is reading it twice by the way anyone who actually does that after each kind trilogy of a new suggestion is there anyone not who even actually a does Kindle? that that's what i couldn't find an ebook of it yeah there's not even i an like the, i just have the uk paperback that's what um, i want that's what i'm gonna get but yeah anyway anyone who actually does that and from reads my it library. Twice, congratulations on being cool <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, does anyone else have any last close, closing thoughts on Lives of Traders? I have one. People yes. always ask, can you skip Lives of Traders? The no. answer is no. 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 I haven't yeah. even That's read on it. Not. It's no. <laughs> yes. My you wouldn't Twitter, wonder. which I rarely use, is literally, Jake, don't skip Live Ship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there were people in my university book club because we did Assassin's Apprentice and they were like, but I'm so attached to Fitz. I'm like, everyone is, damn it. Okay, you. This is not. You're not. Sorry, people. I hate to tell you this. You're not in a unique situation. Like all of you love Fitz. Still read Live Ship. <laughs> if you start Live Ship, yeah. and for some reason you don't like gone. it, you don't have to make yourself finish it. Okay. Like if you read half of Ship of Magic and dislike it, fine. Whatever. Put it down. You can skip it. It whatever. was nice knowing you. But don't <laughs> not try and don't it. contact me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> don't not try. It. All right. It's still a question that comes up on the Robin Hobb subreddit. And every yes. time I'm like, guys, we've been through this. The answer is yeah. done. It's not a point of conversation. You got to read it. But no. yeah, There's people so can take in. take heart in knowing that out of the like dozens of people that I know that have read this series, I know one person who didn't like it. Yeah, hey, same. Nick. Yeah. What's up, yeah. Nick? Are you watching? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, God, he <laughs> <laughs> Nick is I the do person. have one. Yeah, he does yeah, I, not like I, this really. I did think of something. There was a moment, and I just want to ask if you noticed, and if you didn't, obviously I'm going to remind you, the mountain of stone dragon with the arrow in it on the island where Althea was skinning the... Damn straight, I noticed it. Seals. Yeah. I definitely did. Well, I know you did too. Um, <laughs> okay. Also, I want no, one I more thing I'm skipping. It. This is what happens, because you're going to see people who say it's fine, and this is why, because they read Farseer, and then they read Tawny Man, and Tawny Man is brilliant. So they're like, see, no, I read Tawny Man, and it was brilliant, so you can skip it. Okay, of course you think Tawny Man is brilliant. It is brilliant. It's brilliant enough that even if you read it in a stupid way, it's still brilliant. <laughs> that doesn't mean that wasn't a stupid way to go about it. Completely agree. No and judgment. Also read Soldier Son. Yes, read Soldier yeah. Son. I will run the Adelings, go to Soldier Sun. Chris and I are not, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do a Soldier Sun video or something to get these we, people okay. on board. I will do it. I'm gonna finish you my should. reread of Realm of the Elderlings. I promise I will read Soldier Sun after. If you yeah, can read I'm Forest read Mage after. and not think it's the greatest Robin Hobb book of all time, there is something wrong with you. It's uh, I like know for I it to be my the third third book. Book. it will have to be my like, favorite book of all time. Forest Mage was so <laughs> good that I didn't finish the Soldier Sun trilogy for over a year. Yeah. Because like, oh I was I was fine with leaving it at Forest Mage. I was like that that book is a masterpiece yeah it was completely yeah. i have nothing i ever expected to to read it yes yes incredible incredible mm -hmm. and the goodreads reviews are wrong wrong they're all wrong they're so yeah, wrong can't trust goodreads reviews anyway yeah exactly. no, good reviews they are, are wrong yeah. <laughs> i can speak for myself there's that when it came out it wasn't a fitz book and i was angry at it for not being a realm of the old men's book <laughs> that was what enough. i wanted it's not what i got and so i didn't enjoy it which is why I'm going to reread it and be fair because I wasn't fair <laughs> when I read it when it came out. But I've I think grown as a reader, and now I think I you'll love it on a reread. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm expecting to like it considering like favorite author. So yeah, <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just finished the third book uh, just a couple weeks ago. Actually, I was feeling a little hob yeah. itch oh. and couldn't exactly restart a 16 book series at the time. So <laughs> might as well just finish Soldier Son. Why I don't know why it took me so long. It was great. And that third book's great too. Oh yeah. The Forest Mage is the best, but the third book's so, great. Forest Mage is better than most okay. books though. So. Yeah. So okay. Live Ship yeah. Traders is also great. <laughs> this is making me want to like drop everything I'm reading. It's just making so... me want to like just reread it now. <laughs> I'm rereading Robin Hobb already. These things are valid. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Well, anyone have anything else they want to add? Thanks for watching Alex's yeah, videos, thanks. guys. Good work. Thanks, Alex. Thanks to everyone in the chat. Thanks for all of you guys for joining. It was a lot of fun and yeah. excited you to, guys for Tony Man. so much about a book series I've already read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you guys are especially cool if you've read Willful Princess and the Highball Prince before and after Tony Man. <laughs> <laughs> the new rule. Yeah. I don't have to do that right now, then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you could. You have a chance. You have a chance to be like extremely cool. Yeah. all right can't wait all for right. the tawny man reactions in the discords oh, i'm, I'm excited. so excited <laughs> all right see you everyone bye bye Good night.